Hello. Hi. 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 Thank you so much for coming to Science Books. If you're Dr. Francesca Tricotti to talk about her new book, The Protagonist Playbook. Dr. Francesca Tricotti is a sociologist and media scholar whose research examines the relationship between social media, political partisanship, and behavioral inequality. She is an assistant professor at the School of Information and Library Science and a senior research at the Center for Information Technology and Public Life at UNC. Oh, yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> In 2019, she testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee on how search engines are game to drive ideologically based theories. Her research has been covered by The Washington Post, The New York Times, The New Yorker, NPR, and more. Thank you. There's like three seats in the super front. There's one right here, there's too. There's one right here, there's one right there, and there's two over here. So if you all want to like not sit on the floor, I think you should come sit down. Or we can even, you know what, before we get started here, the little this is how you know someone's a professor. You're like, come to the to talk to people you don't know. So thank you to all the people I don't really know for coming because that will allow me to have a few deep breaths and calm down a little bit. So um, today I'm talking about my book that just came out today. Thank you. Thank you for those of you who bought a copy of it. That's phenomenal. Um, it really blows my mind that I wrote a book that people are buying. So that's really, thank you for your support. And I've prepared like a 30 minute talk um, with the goal of us to have like a really robust discussion afterwards. And I made slides for the professor. So that's what I do. And that's how I keep my brain organized. Um, all right, so what I did for my research, how did I um, make the book that you're reading today, is I essentially combined three forms of data analysis. So I'm an ethnographer, which in sociology speak means I spied on a bunch of people that gave me access to their groups. So I sat down with a conservative um, women's group and a, a Republican, hi, a Republican. Um, there's two more seats here uh, and some over there too. So I sat down um, with two Republican groups. Do I need a mic or my, okay, here it was, okay. Um, I sat down with two groups and then I combined ethnographic observations of their meetings, which included weekly meetings, backyard barbecues, political fundraisers, church events, uh, basically you name it, for a couple of months. And then I combined that with in-depth interviews. I also did content analysis of um, all of the news and information that they were identifying as trustworthy sources of news. And then I did YouTube metadata analysis. So I worked with a data scientist to scrape YouTube tags to see how conservative and progressive content was being tagged and circulated online. And then I combined this with a methodological process called media immersion, which for four months, I consumed only news and information from the sources that those I was researching deemed, deemed credible and trustworthy. Now, um, in addition to all this work, I also did uh, in-depth um, observations in Charlottesville, Virginia in three white supremacist rallies that were taking place during the time of my research. And ultimately, the book culminated in a really fantastic rally uh, at the Capitol on January 6th, uh, 2021. And so what I'm going to do is actually end, start where the book ends and work my way back to show how misinformation is actually weaved together within these narratives and traces back for um, hundreds of years in the United States. So um, we're gonna start with how narratives that can be used to both inspire action 
and deny culpability surrounding what happened when Trump supporters stormed the Capitol date back long ago. And so through data triangulation, I'm gonna peel back the leaders of the conservative media manipulation. All right, so what happened on January 6th? January 6th, 2021, we bore witness to what happens when political leaders deny free and fair elections. And we see what happens when they encourage their supporters to do their own research on what they know is not true. We saw what happens when lies turn into a reality. And that day began with a speech from then President of the United States, Donald Trump, where he addressed thousands gathered to protest what they believed to be a stolen election. So this was called the Stop the Steal Rally. It was through this vision of a stolen election that people gathered there. Turn your cameras, please, he said to the news media covering the event, and show what's really happening out there because these people are not going to take it any longer. In the speech, he credited his supporters for inventing the phrase, stop the steal. But it was hardly the creation of MAGA Nation. The keyword stop the steal first appeared when Trump ran in 2016. And we can see this by using Google Trends data. So Google Trends data ultimately takes all the queries that are happening via Google at any given time. Um, they aggregate them and then they, uh, they create a 100 point scale so that you can see which are the terms that are most prominent and which are the terms um, and, and when they become prominent, right? So as you can see from this data uh, provided by Google, um, the concept of Stop the Steal started in 2016. You see this brief blip in search activity right around October 2016. Uh, oh, wait, we won that election. Okay, we don't have to circulate this concept anymore. You see it happen again in 2018. Um, unsurprisingly, when do you think that was happening? During the midterm election, so during October and November of 2018. And then you see it hit again. Um, this is actually the peak of when it could possibly, like 100 out of 100, this is the maximum interest, people searching this. In October 2020, you see a small dip, and then you see this peak again right before the January 6th insurrection, okay? So it wasn't actually this like invention of MAGA Nation. By looking at 2016 Twitter posts around the Stop the Steal hashtag, you can see that lies that were circulating in 2016, 2018, and again in 2020, were circulated on like a pretty well-worn path. Some of them centered around anti-Semitism, right? That George Soros, a Jewish billionaire and humanitarian, had paid to rig the election. This is the 2016 Clinton election that he won, and so it goes away. Others relied on racist tropes like illegal aliens were threatening democracy. Some foreshadowed conservative pundits' obsession with Dominion voting. So you had posts insinuating that voting machines were unreliable. And one tweet even included an advertisement for a company titled Trump Ballot Security with the email stopthesteal at gmail.com. I sent them an email, I never got it. <laughs> Roger Stone, a conservative political consultant and lobbyist, openly supported the Stop the Steal movement in 2016, encouraging groups in contested areas to talk with voters as they left the polls, supporting Trump's concept of poll watchers, right, and encouraging those there on January 6th to rally around Stop the Steal. So for over four years, Stop the Steal had been gaining momentum, and Trump used that to his advantage, encouraging those there on January 6th to leave the Stop the Steal rally and walk down to the Capitol. And after this, he said, we're going to walk down and I'll be with you, he promised. We're going to take, we're going to walk down to the Capitol because you'll never take back our country with weakness. We've amassed overwhelming evidence about a fake election. He went on to fill the ears of his supporters with unsubstantiated claims of fraud including, but not limited to, dead people had voted, non-citizens had voted, 
tens of thousands of votes were switched from Trump to Biden, that Dominion voting machines had a 93.67% error rate. This is language used in the speech that day. That secret operatives were stuffing thousands of unsecured ballots into duffel bags on park benches. This was also part of his speech that day. And at one point during his speech, Trump asserted that the presidential election of 2020 was the most corrupt election in history, possibly in the world. By framing those who stood before him as patriots, Trump proclaimed that our brightest days are still before us, before encouraging his supporters to fight like hell, before they didn't have a country anymore. So the people there that day listened to his call for action. As we know, um, they walked in mass down Pennsylvania Avenue to take their country back. Um, in the end, Trump did not join his supporters as he promised. Um, he took to Twitter, right, and Facebook. He posted a video, he live tweeted under the event, under the protection of Secret Service. Um, and as Capitol Police officers shot a Trump supporter, he released a pre-taped response from the White House lawn, encouraging those to go home, um, but still claiming that the election was stolen. Despite Trump's clear and motivational stance and video showing hundreds of Trump supporters ransacking the Capitol, the right-wing information ecosystem quickly tried to capitalize on the power of the internet and frame the violence on Antifa, right-wing, Antifa and Black Lives Matter. And here are some of the clips that were going on on Twitter, on radio, in the news, and via news publications. So as I describe in my book, um, lies require more than just one enigmatic leader, right? We need more than just Trump for something to take hold. Um, conservative politicians and, pundit and pundits boosted the credibility of the claims of a false election, right? So they reiterated in their information networks that this was a stolen election. Um, but they also tried to deflect blame for the violence that transpired as a result of these lies. So Candace Owens, who is a very prominent media figure who many of you might not know, but happy to talk more about in Q&A. Uh, she tweeted that Antifa thugs were in the mix. Todd Herman, um, who was filling in for Rush Limbaugh's podcast that day, claimed that he had been monitoring Antifa chat channels and knew firsthand that Antifa had embedded themselves among the protesters and were the ones causing problems. Um, this is a quote from that uh, podcast that day on January 6th. A one American news anchor described the chaos as Antifa led to tactics. And when interviewed about what happened on January 6th, uh, on Lou Dobbs's Fox Business Show, Representative Mo Brooks said, that there were two parts to this event and that there were indications that fascist Antifa elements had embedded themselves in the Trump rally. The Washington Times posted this article titled, Facial Recognition Identifies Extremists Storming the Capitol. And in the article say that the facial recognition software and the extremists were Antifa, that Antifa were behind storming the Capitol and that they had facial recognition software confirming this. Confirming this. Uh, Representative Paul Gosler shared that story on Twitter. This tweet is still up, by the way. Okay. You're welcome to take a look. <laughs> it's still up, even though um, Washington Post uh, printed a, uh, a correction to the article. And the next morning, Representative Matt Gates from Florida took to the House floor and used this article as evidence to claim that some people who reached the Capitol were members of the violent terrorist group Antifa. Now, even though the Washington Times retracted the article, this lie is still easily substantiated through a simple legal search. 
So if you search on Google or your um, search engine of choice, I'd love to talk about this more later too. People are like, oh, good thing I use DuckDuckGo. But same thing on DuckDuckGo. Um, Washington Times Antifa Evidence. The top return is this article. And then the summary of this article provided via Google um, reconfirms this false claim, right? That Antifa members were the ones behind the violence on January 6th. And although the FBI has found zero evidence to back these claims, disinformation surrounding the insurrection persists. According to multiple polls, um, a large number, right, 20% of Republican voters still believe that the violence that happened on January 6th was a result of Antifa. Um, over a third of Americans defined the protest on January 6th as legitimate protest. A majority of Republicans do not view the storming of the Capitol as an attack on the government, and a majority do not hold Trump responsible. <clears throat> and when the January 6th, the bipartisan committee that was created for investigating January 6th, all those hearings that have been aired, when the initial bipartisan committee was created, um, the House Homeland Security Committee demanded that examination of violence from, and I quote, far left groups like Antifa also be investigated alongside insurrectionists. <clears throat> but it would be a mess for us to think that these opinions were somehow formed in isolation or rare distortions of reality. For in fact, this is a very tired recycled narrative. Um, and dates all the way back to the 1800s when during Reconstruction, Black Americans were able to use their voting rights and for the first time, elect Black men to serve in Congress. So when their voting rights created representation for themselves, shortly thereafter, lies circulated that African Americans had abused their voting privileges, engaged in corruption, and stood generally unfit for democracy. The language used by Trump to secure election observers because of this idea of a false election is also a reused effort to suppress the minority vote and affect electoral outcomes. So back in 1981, the Republican National Committee created the National Ballot Security Task Force. This was a group of armed off-duty police officers hired to patrol stations in traditionally black and Hispanic neighborhoods. So the falsehood that others read black and brown persons steal their elections is subsequently used to justify their own efforts to impact election outcomes, right? We're living in a state of vastly redistributed voter maps contingent on this idea that elections are somehow stolen. And the recent legislation in Georgia, right, right, titled the Election Integrity Act, and restricts access to the polls and early voting situations. Um, these two are based on this narrative of stolen elections. Unfortunately, what we can see through my research is that the same threats to patriotism, calls to protectionism, and scapegoating the left, specifically Antifa, were narratives that first surfaced in Charlottesville, Virginia during the summer of 2017. So many people now, especially with the five year anniversary of the August 12th um, event that took place, the Unite the Right rally that took place in Charlottesville, a lot of people, um, know about that event. I would say fewer people know what happened previously. So there was actually a pretty fantastic foreshadowing event that took place in May 2017. My family and I witnessed firsthand because we stumbled, stumbled across it. We were walking to the International Festival that day. Um, 
and Richard Spencer had organized around the removing of the Confederate flag, or excuse me, the Confederate statues in the neighborhood. So on May 13th, um, UVA alumni Richard Spencer organized a rally claiming that removing the Confederate statues was censorship. <coughs> right? um, they screamed a lot of the same chants that ended up coming back through surfacing again and again. Uh, but they used the removing of the Confederate monuments as proof of what they refer to as cultural genocide or white. On July 8th of 2017, um, the KKK, members of the KKK from North Carolina, uh, dressed in their regalia and um, came to the same park, right? Waving Confederate flags and equating the removal of Confederate statues as cultural genocide. And this culminated on both August 11th and then August 12th as people came again for the Unite the Right rally, rendezvousing, organizing, creating shuttles that brought people back and forth, right, to their parking stations. And they had been there, right? Um, because again, they were angry and they were mad about the removal of these Confederate statues. So why am I bringing up Unite the Right? And how does it connect? <laughs> One, they organized in the exact same way. So they used Facebook. Um, this was actually, so part of my research, I created a Facebook account specifically to this project and where I would friend people through an informed consent process after the interviews. And then I would use news and information that they liked, shared, or commented on to help me make sense of the news and information landscape. Um, and it was through Facebook that I found out about the Unite the Right um, free speech rally. So it was organized, it was a public event organized by Jason Kessler. He then used Twitter uh, to answer people's questions. And it was through these forums that I started reading about Antifa, encouraging people to come armed to these events because of the fear Antifa would have in disrupting their events. As the rally was unfolding, online chat rooms were already trying to deflect the blame away from white supremacist groups that had gathered there that day, using the language of Antifa. So one, they were trying to frame this person, this was misinformation uh, circulating on these message boards with, this is not the person, the, the driver um, of the car that ran into the uh, downtown mall and killed Tyler Heyer. But you'll see, um, and it's pretty small, but they were framing him as a radical leftist who was angry about Trump and trying to make Trump look bad. So he had driven all the way across country to get in his car and um, take, out, take out what was otherwise a peaceful gathering. Uh, and they're framing it as an anti-fa rally when this was very much organized as a white supremacist rally. No question about it. So you see this language of Antifa, which we saw again resurface as a beautiful scapegoat, um, creating momentum all the way back from August 11th and 12th. Infowars published an article titled Bombshell Connection Between Charlottesville, Soros, and the CIA, claiming that Soros, who I'm sure you remember from those Stop the Steal, um, the lovely Jewish billionaire villain uh, du jour, um, had paid Antifa protesters to attend the Charlottesville rally and try to make Trump look bad. In the weeks and months that followed, and this is all news and information that was shared on Facebook, um, people were trying to frame the agitators, the violence, the fear that transpired at this event on the left. Um, so you'll see in these, these are different, very different ones, uh, leftist protesters, uh, sorry media, this is not what peaceful looks like. Um, Richard Spencer has always been awful, but so are protesters screaming over him as though um, 
people coming should have had this like genuine dialogue with Richard Spencer, this avowed white supremacist gathering um, under this idea of genocide. So many people might remember Trump claiming that there were, and I quote, very fine people on both sides. Uh, but Trump also asserted that there was blame on both sides. And understanding that second part of that, right, the blame on both sides, is equally important, right? This purposeful misdirection and use of the phrase outsiders, blame on both sides, actually echoes language used by segregationists who describe civil rights protesters as communist agitators and is reminiscent of Nixon's 1960s campaign speech where he blamed racial conflict happening during the civil rights era as extremists of both races. So for conservative politicians and pundits, the good guys were the sons of the Confederacy. Those who showed up to protect the statue. And the bad guys on the other side or on both sides, were the real white supremacists who were different. And Antifa, part of this supposedly, supposed radical leftist regime. What was really fascinating is that those I interviewed as part of my study also believed what their news and political respondents were telling them, right? That this was not the fault of Trump supporters. Uh, uh. So one of the strategies of creating chaos, the respondent tell me, it's like Soros or similar groups, it's been proven and documented. All of a sudden, these people from out of town, they show up, they don't live here. You know, and I think that adds to the fakeness of the whole thing. So during interviews, people that I spoke with were saying to me that what happened on August 12th um, was not new, right? That it had been created by radical leftists to make Trump support. Another respondent described the torchlight march that happened in Charlottesville on August 11th as their own little rally, insisting that white supremacists had caused no harm or damage. She went on to tell me that it wasn't until Saturday, August 12th, when the, and this is in quotes, the social justice warriors and the Antifa and the left side came out. That's when the real violence And another respondent in a one-on-one -on -one interview said, these other groups, Black Lives Matter, the Antifa, whatever, they are known to be agitators. They are known for burning down cities. And I can tell you what, as an American citizen, I'm really sick of this crap. So taken collectively, the statements of the conservative media personalities that I studied, the President of the United States, my respondents, looking at both what happened on August 12th and August 13th, excuse me, August 11th and 12th, as well as January 6th, are taken together to create two things. First, they create a narrative whereby those who show up to protect, whether that be the Capitol or the Confederate monuments or patriotism, these are the good guys. They are different from the bad guys. Second, these quotes just demonstrate how disinformation flows along a well-worn and predictable path. Media pundits and politicians have worked together to create a unified villain. <coughs> that the left, and this is referred to by many names, Black Lives Matter, Antifa, social justice warriors, or the newest iteration critical race theory uh, is somehow dangerous. This is a cornerstone of the propaganda regularly fed to audiences. But these political tactics do more than simply encourage their supporters to vote, right? These tactics have legal ramifications and they date back for centuries. It's how the founding fathers denied Native American citizenship so they couldn't participate in the electoral process. 
which would allow the FBI to classify Martin Luther King as a communist threat and monitor him for decades. And it's why James Fields' attorney, the man who ran his car into a crowded mall of people, killing a person, um, was able to operate under a claim of self-defense. As my research demonstrates, uh, media manipulators have a remarkable understanding of how misinformation is connected to worldviews. And they routinely and effectively curate sets of phrases um, in order to optimize, monetize around these unique concepts. And this is perhaps the most dangerous part of the loop. So what's often promoted as an avenue for self-discovery is more like participating in a scavenger hunt engineered by those who are spreading lies. Right? They suggest that audiences go out and search for the truth on their own, but only after seeding the internet with problematic content. And this is what I call the I IKEA effect of disinformation. We'll get to that in a little bit. <laughs> so they tag and they um, seed internet content so that they can fall within this well, well worn ideology. So I write about this, and, and we can talk. This has been covered in the Washington Post, right? Um, at one point, Google was auto-completing Russia collusion with delusion. This is the number, the number one return. Um, during the first impeachment trial of President Trump, Devin Nunez took his time during the <coughs> during his opening remarks to say that we shouldn't be talking about Trump. What we actually need to pay attention to is Nellie Orr. Um, can I just take a quick poll? Who here knows who Nellie Orr is? I know how every single one of you voted. <laughs> <laughs> because Nellie Orr exists in a conservative vacuum, right? She is a she is a person who was created, who was married to Department of Justice Bruce Orr, and because they were married at the time of the investigation into Trump. And she worked for Fusion GPS. And Fusion GPS was investigating Trump. And that dossier turned out to be like no good. It fueled the larger conspiracy that people were out to get Trump, right? That this was a witch hunt, that he had done nothing wrong, that they were trying to overrule the law of the people. And so Nellie Orr, and even if you Google her still today, um, she's like, no one else is talking about this, right? In fact, when this happened, I was out of doing my media immersion, and I was driving to work, and I like heard, I was like listening to the impeachment trial, and I heard him say Nellie Orr, and I was like, I just have a small stroke. Like, what is happening? <laughs> this just happened because I was not expecting. I hadn't heard that phrase in months. Um, so yeah. So the trouble is, people who are trying to fact check information from themselves might unintentionally strengthen their belief in these false claims, like I showed you when you Google Antifa evidence, Washington Times. Um, in an effort to do their own research, people are trying to search for something they see on Facebook, but because of the keywords they enter, they end up just getting the same bad content they saw on Facebook. And they really understand, right, that by seeing the internet and tagging things with certain content, by garnering this interest, that Google Trends data, that spike in Stop the Steal, um, that was not by happenstance, right? That was a very highly crafted uh, information campaign to the point where if you put in Stop the Duh, Google um, auto-completed stuff that was steel, directing searchers to their nearest rally location. So this leads to what I refer to in my book as the IKEA effect of misinformation. So business scholars have found that when consumers put together pretty low quality furniture on their own, they tend to value it more. So, and they see this like through like Craigslist stuff, like people, if they put the chair, they're like, this is like totally worth it. And this is definitely not, right? It's a really bad chair. Um, but because they've taken this time and they've invested in it, in this merchandise, 
um, they feel more competent and happier with their purchase. And what my research demonstrates is that conspiracy theorists and propagandists are drawing on the same strategy, providing a tangible do-it-yourself quality to the information they provide. So independently conducting a search on a given topic makes audiences feel like they're engaging in an act of self-discovery uh, when they're actually just participating in this scavenger hunt engineered by those spreading the lies. Now, what's really fascinating, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene described how she engaged in this process firsthand when she testified before Congress as the House debated whether or not to remove her from her two committees. This is up available on C-SPAN. I highly recommend you watch this clip. Um, she basically explained that she didn't trust the mainstream media. She thought that Trump was lying to her, that, we were, that they were lying to her about Trump. So she went to Google and she looked up her own information and it literally led her to QAnon, right? And she talks about this process of self-discovery um, and she's an elected representative, right? So these processes work. As voters and residents, we have to push back on two things. This is a big thing that I talk about in my book. One, we have to recognize that these narratives of extremism are really embedded um, into these narratives of stolen elections, right? That the concept of a stolen election is predicated on this idea of white supremacy, that only certain people should be allowed to vote. And, and we need to push back on that narrative. Um, the other thing that I really want us to get from the book is a, a more nuanced understanding of how keywords work in our search function. So we think a lot about this idea of like filter bubbles and echo chambers, and it's really easy to put all the blame on the technology companies. Uh, but actually, we teach them an awful lot, and a lot of what we teach them is rooted in those first words that we start with. And I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that um, in the Q&A as well. And the last thing I hope that we can do um, is work together to create more practical guides and understandings of how these disinformation feedbacks work. Because oftentimes people are saying, like, well, how do we fix Google, or how do we fix, or I go to DuckDuckGo, I'm like, oh, this still Point, right? Um, and so what we really need to understand is that disinformation isn't a bug in the code. That's not something that can be fixed via a uh, search engine UX designer. Um, it's actually a feature being wielded for political gain. And this is a great risk to American democracy. So thank you for your my pilot talk. <laughs> reinforces our shared sense of reality. So let me bring a non-political um, one in, because that's one of my favorites. So we, in the United States, very much think of this idea of like the sky is blue. Um, it's kind of this unthinking concept. Oh, it's blue as the sky. Yeah, sky is blue. It's Carolina blue. <laughs> Sorry? It's Carolina blue. Carolina blue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to work that so, so we think of the sky is blue. Um, but say you don't think of the sky as blue. Actually, this idea of a blue sky uh, is socially constructed by whether or not blue is part of your natural environment and whether or not your community has a word for blue. So if you search the sky is blue, um, Google returns all kinds of great stuff, right? Pictures of blue skies, Google images of blue skies, and what? But if you Google the sky is not blue, um, you get your top return is information about how the chemical compounds in the atmosphere change the color of the sky. And so you can read that and be like, oh yeah, well, the sky isn't blue. You know, it's actually chemical. And then if you Google the sky is green, um, Google reconfirms that reality, right? <laughs> uh, so they'll put images of green sky and they'll show you about how before tornado, the sky was green. Um, if you Google the sky is red, 
you get information about like red sky at night, sailors delight. Red yeah. sky in the morning, sailors take warning, right? The origins behind that. And then it's like just seas of images reconfirm that reality. So when we start with our, we often I think go to Google as this like window into the wider world, but search engines are programmed on what is referred to as relevance. And relevance takes a lot of things into account, like your geolocation, your past search history. But one of the main things it takes into account are your starting points, your keywords. And so when you put input in, input out, right? So we have to think a lot more about those starting points. A political example that I like to describe is like how worldviews shape our ideas of things. So if you have a worldview that considers immigration as something illegal aliens versus undocumented workers. If you do like illegal alien voter fraud, um, the top return is ICE, the ICE government website that confirms like I think there were 19 cases of voter fraud um, by illegal aliens uh, in the state of North Carolina. That's like the top return. And if you Google undocumented workers voting rights, right, the top return is definitely not ICE. The top return is the ACLU and like why um, citizenship status shouldn't matter for voting. It should be about tax, your income tax, right? You should be able to vote. So those keywords really do um, make a big difference in terms of the kinds of information that's going to be returned to us. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Hi. Is, could the conservative researcher in academia, is there any one conservative research in academia that you were aware of that could write the same book on the big book? Yeah, great years. question. This is a very good, I also address this in my book. So don't people on the right, uh, excuse me, don't people on the left tag information um, and optimize the search engine optimization and um, can't they utilize the same tactics? So yeah, they could, right? 100%. Uh, in my it, so, so in one of the chapters I did a YouTube analysis of how tags, like how content creators tag their content, and um, progressive content creators are horrible at understanding <laughs> search engine optimization. Yeah. Right? So it's like the number. So we did eight. It was like eight conservative, eight um, progressive YouTubers, and um, the top channel that the, the channel that most frequently tagged their content with social justice was Jordan Peterson, who's like a very conservative <laughs> personality. Definitely not um, like this feminist channel, right? That was like, and also Prager University, which is a very prominent conservative media outlet, tags more of their content with feminism than they do conservatism. So they understand like search engine optimization better. So that's one. Two, um, there is an example where I show Dan Savage, who's a very prominent uh, progressive radio personality, um, spread like a pretty uh, salacious form of misinformation around Rick Santorum that some of you may or may not know. What is a Santorum? <laughs> I'll let you Google that on your own. Um, uh, Dan Savage is hilarious. And so, but what, what, in order for that to happen, he had to leverage this like really robust radio network along with like, a huge fan base. Um, and so, yeah, there are these like isolated examples, but for whatever reason, they don't seem to understand. Political strategists like don't seem to understand. And then the last thing that I talk about in my book is um, progressive political strategists have no sense of unification. So political strategists on the right have taken decades to um, essentially meld together people under what I refer to as the five F's of conservatism. There are no five of anything progressive, but there's like things we ultimately like really agree on. And we need, I mean, I would say if they wanted to be effective, take the third book, right? Make a five F's. <laughs> um, and so I think it's possible. And then the last thing that I just want to throw out there, this is drawing on the work of um, Harvard scholars that did like an insane amount of data work on how information flows. And um, right-wing media uh, does not use the same methods of investigatory journalism and like spreading objective um, truth, right? And so we have to take into account that like, sure, um, 
journalists on the left might take advantage of search engine optimization, but that doesn't mean they're like spreading lies on the same way. So it's also like a matter of like the content itself. Did I answer your question? Oh, sorry, last thing. Power and time, right? That's the other thing. Um, they really have way more money. Um, in the book, you mentioned that as far back as 1994, like conservatives had like a list of vocabulary words yeah. that they constructed that they told their politicians to use. Yeah. So, I guess my question is: in the process of the investigation, like, are, have you come across any reason why so many like political terms related to leftism, like we use the right term for it? So, like, even in today's presentation, like social justice warrior the real violence, white genocide, cultural genocide, radical leftist, those are all invented by the right. Like we, why do they, so why I do we use say, their I, I would disagree with you on some of them. So I would say some of the stuff were created by the right, like um, climate change was created by Frank Lutz in the 1990s as part of the contract of America to make it seem like the science was still out on global warming. Well, okay, what, what's an outdoor space because like, either created or redefined. Sure, by. redefined. So I would say in terms of like redefining and reappropriation, you know, Foucault's concept of power and language is power, right? right. And so if you already hold like pretty, um, and you look at like, in terms of like white male wealth <coughs> and, and white male representation in politics, uh, if you already have a lot of power, you have the ability to reappropriate content much easier, um, and I talk about this in Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter. Um, so the, the ability to like recapture and, um, and retool and reuse concepts uh, is predicated on having power to begin with. Um, and so what I try to do in this book is demonstrate those like lopsided power dynamics and why um, it's not as like, equal um, for that reason. Does that make sense? It does. But yeah, we're really like, Sorry, I say we, but like, I mean, progressives are like the left is really extremely bad at it. Bad at it. I, I <laughs> talked about this the other day. It's like the new thing that they passed related to climate change. They called it like the inflation, <laughs> inflation rising bill or something. And I'm like, oh my God, inflation, inflation reduction. But like the last thing we need before an election is like talk about inflation being real, right? That's like, the war, like you gotta name it like no child left behind. Right, so that you're voting against children, yeah. and like, how horrible are you? You know, um, yeah, like words matter. Yeah. Did you say a word or two about how the organized Christian religion, evangelical flavor, and their associated universities were involved in all this? Sure, sure. So, one of the concepts I talk about in my book is the role is that conservatism is not just a worldview, it's a media practice. And literalist translations of texts are rooted in like a very heavily Protestant engagement with the Bible and like an elevation of individualist, um, you know, equating in the individual with the clergy, right? It's like breaking down those barriers. I would say um, with the universities, um, the only one that comes to mind is like Hillsdale College, which is like a pretty conservative um, religious university that publishes like news. Um, and they have like a newsletter. Um, but I talk about it in my book and I draw on this other, this other really great book called Pro Prophets and Patriots that I highly recommend. It talks about how religion can be used on the left and the right. It's not exclusive to any one um, Denominate like religion has been used historically for progressive. I mean, Martin Luther King, right? I, I used the scripture, used the word uh, to advance like a lot of equality. So it's not just like elevation of the Bible, but um, it's like a biblical inerrancy that is distinct amongst conservative voters. And I call this practice scriptural inference. And I talk about how it. It's not just exclusive to the pulpit that it's applied like to constitutional um, the constitution right so constitutional literalists uh, use the same method of like dissecting line by line oh okay we only have 10 minutes left so I can just 
question. Um, assuming you're not funded by Soros, uh, were you worried about like this being like, see, it's proof they do have plants, like they are in our our, our circles. Like, how would you respond to, to someone saying that like you are, like you're uh, proving them right? Ah, okay. So I would say George Soros Open Society Foundation does fund a lot of research, right? They fund part of the research that they do in society. Um, I would say think tank, like funding research is different than the claim that George Soros paid like thousands of people $10 <laughs> to get on a bus and somehow create this like outside agitation presence that otherwise would have been like super peaceful if just the white supremacists had been allowed to be there. Um, but yeah, so I think what that just ties back to is interesting. What I find fascinating about, and I talk about this in my book, is that, um, for example, when I was at the KKK rally, a bunch of people that didn't live in Charlottesville were there protesting the removal of Confederate statues. But they didn't uh, understand themselves to be outsiders, right? So they were like, oh, all these outsiders are here today. And I'm like, oh, where do you live? And they're like, we're all Right or something, and I was like, hmm, that's pretty far from Charlottesville, right? So like, it's this positionality of thinking that like their land is any land, mm -hmm. and that like all these others are like encroaching on their space, public space, and a, a lot of that is demarcated public space as remnants of like white supremacy and like white only spaces. Yeah, you'll be our last question. Okay, um, you in talking about uh, white supremacists and. Jews, um, the imagining of white supremacist nirvana, and in that nirvana, the women would have certain very defined roles, mm -hmm. the men would have other roles. What did you find in the people you interviewed that were the significant gender differences? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think gender, so I talk about this a little bit in um, the role of family and family being a very heteronormative space where um, men are the ones who go to work and women are the ones who stay home and raise their children. Um, and that also obviously bleeds into the idea of like, anti-abortion rhetoric, right? This notion that like women could just stay home and take care of the baby as an option. Um, <laughs> the more the better. Right, <laughs> the more the better. Um, and it also would talk about this, um, so uh, white supremacy is like super mainstream and this idea of white decline and using demographic data to support this idea that whiteness is somehow under attack in the United States is part of all mainstream conservative content. And in an article I wrote for Define American, it's out, it's just like a free open source article, we look at um, the role white of white decline, and that's specifically on this idea that women need to be having more babies, white women need to be having more babies with white men, um, because the decline of whiteness in the United States is proof that there's women in power. <laughs> I think that's all. I, I got. We have to have a hard stop. Everyone's got to be happy here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that I'm still waiting for my check from George Soros. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ten years ago. Yeah. So yeah. On your way out, George Soros will give you each five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was really great. Thank you. Yeah.